uh, for those people that might not have been able to join us today, or if you wanted to send this to a friend and watch it later, um, just letting everyone know we will be recording it and we will put it on our Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself and then I will actually hand it over to our speaker of the day, which is Allison Zach, and I'll let her introduce herself. Uh, my name is Monica McCoubrey and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. I am located here in the Lincoln office. And so um, if you have any questions throughout the chat or throughout the program today, if you want to use the chat function, uh, just go ahead and ask your question and we'll get to them as soon as we can. And then there will be a question answer session at the end as well. So um, it shouldn't be a very long program today. We wanted to keep it short and kind of just some good um, small information to start. So again, if you have any questions, you can either private message me or odds are if you have a question, I bet someone else will have the same question. So go ahead and put that in the chat. So I will go ahead and hand it over to Allison uh, to go ahead and start our program today. Great. Thanks, Monica. <clears throat> my name is Allison Zock and I coordinate the Nebraska Invasive Species Program. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so we can look at the presentation. Okay, Monica, let me know if you can't see that, okay? Okay, so if you're not familiar, the Nebraska Invasive Species Program is a grant funded program at the University of Nebraska. And I coordinate the pr program and it is grant funded through the Game and Parks Commission as well as Fish and Wildlife Service and other donors. And we serve as a clearinghouse of information on invasive species of all taxa of concern to Nebraska. We're gonna start by watching a video from the National Geographic. And if you wanna watch this video in the future, you can put this um, in your browser link, this, this link here, or you can go to YouTube and just search for it by this name. Rapidly growing, consuming, ad adapting, they conquer. Jeopardizing local economies, threatening human health, and devastating entire ecosystems. As whole rows of cherished landmarks are condemned, Brought home to town-dwelling citizens are the rigid precautions being taken by the Department of Agriculture to save this tree from extinction. Invasive species are non-native organisms that cause considerable damage when introduced to a new area. These species compete with native wildlife for resources and thrive at the expense of the local ecosystem. The introduction of invasive species is often associated with human activity. Boats that travel between different bodies of water can carry hitchhikers, such as the zebra mussel. One of the most notorious invasive species in the United States, these rapidly reproducing mussels clog pipes and overtake beaches in the Great Lakes. Some invasive species, however, are introduced intentionally. In the early 20th century, cane toads were brought to Australia as a form of pest control. Today, these poisonous amphibians number in the millions and have caused a decline in native predators on the island. It's not just animals. Bacteria, fungi, and plants can also become invasive. Brought to South Africa in the 19th century, the black wattle is an invasive tree often used for timber and firewood. This beautiful tree and other thirsty invasives are depleting the country's already record low water supply. Because of their impact on human health, ecosystems, and infrastructure, invasive species cost the global economy over a trillion dollars each year. Many measures can be taken to help limit the spread of invasive species, but the most effective method is prevention. By carefully cleaning boats before transferring between different bodies of water, not releasing exotic pets into the wild, and planting gardens with native species, we can help prevent the spread of invasive organisms. Every living thing has evolved to play a specialized role within their ecosystem. 
In the ultimate balancing act, even one invasive species can drastically tilt the scales. If we stay mindful of our role in the spread of these organisms, we can prevent invasions before it is too late. Okay, so you, this was a nice overview um, of invasives. So we're gonna drill down a little more now and talk specifically about what are invasive species and some examples for you. So invasive species, like you heard, are organisms that are not native. And so some invasive species come to us from different places in the world. Some invasive species are native to one part of the United States, but are invasive in others. Um, they can be aquatic or terrestrial. They often cause issues that will make threatened and endangered species um, more imperiled. And also they Im impact agricultural crops. And unfortunately, us as humans are inadvertently moving them every day. And so things like um, moving our boats from one, body, one water body to another without clean draining and drying, or um, shipments of, of products from other parts of the world are just a couple of examples of how we move invasive species. <clears throat> so the federal definition of invasive species is a non-native species that causes that's introduction causes impacts to the economy, the environment, or human health. And we spend $120 billion a year in the United States managing invasive species. Invasive species are to blame for 42% of, of endangered species being listed, and that's mainly due to competition for habitat and food. There are several characteristics that define invasive species and allow them to outcompete native species. This includes rapid growth rate. And here is pictured a big head carp. These carp grow very quickly and grow to a size of 90 pounds. And so by growing quickly, they're able to evade native um, aquatic species and they lack predators on our river systems. In Asia where they're native, there's large fish that predate on them and keep them in check. But in our river systems, we do not have a predator that's large enough to keep them in check. And unfortunately, um, they have high reproduction. Another characteristic of invasive species is, is adaptations. And the feral hog pictured here has an adaptation of reverting very quickly to having coarse hair once it leaves a farm. And also it will become afraid of humans. And so those adaptations allow it to uh, thrive once it's out in the wild. They also have very quick and, and prolific pro, um, reproduction. A female can have two litters a year and can have 10 piglets in each litter. So very quickly, you have a lot of feral hogs on the landscape. I'm gonna highlight here for you some invasive species of concern in Nebraska. The first is the spotted lanternfly. And this has not been found in Nebraska, but we're very concerned about it getting here. And so we want you to be keeping an eye out for it and let us know if you ever see it or something that looks like it. So these pictures at the top make it look like a really big bug, but it's not. If you look at the picture in the bottom middle, that is a spotted lanternfly on a tree leaf. So these are very small insects. And on the far left is them without when they're not flying. And then in the middle is when they are flying. So those are the two different looks. And these are called a plant hopper. Uh, they have a piercing mouth part that they use to pierce into trees and vines and suck out uh, fluids. And then they excrete a sugary substance, which is pictured on the right here. And that sugary substance will grow black sooty mold. And that mold will actually um, cause damage to trees and vines and will weaken them and they can be susceptible to disease and it can actually kill them. And the problem with these insects is they like to feed upon grapes and apples and hops and hardwood trees. And those are million dollar industries in the United States. And so if this insect were to become widespread throughout the United States, we are talking millions of dollars of impact to those industries. The reason I'm showing you this in Nebraska is because these insects like to lay egg masses on everything and that includes vehicles. So we have trucks coming from the East Coast where these are found currently every day and they could contain these egg masses as well as other products that are being moved. And so the Department of Agriculture is being proactive and has started doing surveys of Tree of Heaven, which is the host tree for this invasive species to catch it and, and find it and eradicate it. But again, if you ever see something like this, please come to my website and report it. An aquatic invasive species I wanna highlight for you is the silver carp. 
And the silver carp is large. You can see on the far left here, it can get up to 77 pounds. These fish are voracious eaters and they eat 40% of their body weight every day in plankton. And plankton's an important uh, food source for other aquatic, invasive, uh, aquatic species in our rivers, such as paddlefish. And so by having a lot of these fish in the river, we're depriving our native and, and desired species. Every female will, can have up to 2 million eggs a year that they'll release into the water. And so quickly you have a lot of sil silver carp. And like you can see, they're very large. So we don't have a predator that's controlling these. And so these have caused a lot of issues in our river systems. And we have um, grant funding now that we're gonna be doing some research to better locate where these actually are in our state, as well as looking into some management options. They are also concerned because they like to jump. So these, these um, carp are very, um, sensitive to the sound of motorboats. And so once you have motorboats, they can actually get agitated and jump and they can jump up to 20 feet in the air. So every year we have injuries of people getting hit in the head, unfortunately, by these fish. And an invasive plant that we deal with a lot in Nebraska is Phragmites. And this is a really tall reed species. It is 12 feet tall. And as you see on the left, it will form dense stands. And these dense stands will cause flooding such as in the Omaha area. And so for the last, since 2012, um, we've been actively spraying these, in, these plants on our river systems to prevent flooding, as well as to keep them in check because they will overcome sandbars and other habitat, which will keep our wildlife species um, from thriving. Um, they're very hard to control these plants because they have lots of seeds. As you can see on the top right, every one of those seed heads is, it has thousands of seeds and they're windborne and they can spread very long distances. They also reproduce by stolons. And so if you see on the right bottom there, they will shoot out these runners, these stolons, and every node on those will be a new Phragmites plant. So very quickly, when you have one plant in an area, it will become many Phragmites plants because of these reproductive uh, techniques. And you'll see on the right here, those stolons being held in the hand of that person shows how far out they will send these stolons towards the water. And that's how they can then take over sandbars. An invasive wildlife species you may have even seen in your backyard is a Eurasian colored dove. And Eurasian colored doves look very similar to our native morning dove. However, they have this collar around the back of their neck. And these are not native to America. Um, they're concerned because they're very aggressive and they compete with our native and desired songbirds for habitat and food. They also carry a parasite that can be shed in bird feeders, and then other songbirds can, can acquire that and die. Also, if a bird of prey like a hawk were to eat one of these uh, doves that's infested, it can make that uh, hawk very sick. An example of an invasive pathogen would be the white nose syndrome. And this is a cold loving fungus and it, it attacks bats. And so bats overwinter um, in large groups in caves and other uh, dwellings. And because they're communal um, mammals, they spread this from one, to one bat to another. And so it's very hard to keep them from spreading it to each other. What this does is you'll see the white on this bat's nose and arms. And what this does is it burns. So these bats are sleeping and they're, they're wanting to sleep and hibernate over the winter, but this will wake them up because it burns and they'll fly around and they'll try to find water and they will die because they will use up all their fat reserves. And so this is very bad because we have many species of bats that are rare, and this is gonna to lead to them becoming even more imperiled. Good news is that there's lots of research underway to find solutions of how we can treat hibernacula to keep um, white nose syndrome from occurring in those, those caves and also to possibly rehabilitate bats. But um, much research is to be done to find a solution here. It is widespread throughout the United States, as you'll see on the right. We do have it in Nebraska. Um, but unlike New York and some other places, we don't have the large cave hibernacula, which is good for our bats. Um, but of course it is still an issue for us. So with that, Monica, if you have any questions specifically, we can open it up or I can continue along. 
Um, we don't have any questions yet. Um, I just, for those of you that are interested in, if you see some of these things that Allison has pointed out, um, where do you report them? So I did put the anyinvasives.com. Um, you can find a lot of information, all this information that Allison's talking about. And then it's just anyinvasives.com slash report a sighting. So um, I think it's like a form to fill out and um, it asks for your name and your uh, location and that kind of stuff. And so that then just gets submitted and um, it reports that sighting. So otherwise we don't have any questions yet. So thank you. Okay, well, what can we do to prevent all of these invasive species and to keep us from spending 120 billion a year, right? So there's lots of work being done by lots of different agencies in Nebraska and across the nation. And one is research. So there's lots of research underway to find management options for different invasive species and also research on biological controls, which is a living organism you release in the environment to then control a species. And so one, uh, research thing I'd like to highlight is the um, research for zebra mussel control. So as our video highlighted, zebra mussels are a very small, a very small muscle, and they have rate, they have high rates of reproduction. So once you have zebra mussels in a lake, it's very hard to control them because they have millions of offspring every year. And so they've been doing trials in different states to find bacteria or chemicals that we could use to potentially control them in an open water system. The bad news is that they are very hard to kill in an open water system. So maybe one day we'll have a silver bullet for a zebra mussel in a lake, but at the time we don't currently, but there's lots of research. Um, another thing I'd like to highlight is all the survey work that our resource agencies and organizations do. So we have organizations and people that are sampling for insects, for invasive aquatics, for plants and for animals. And so this is an example here of how we sample for zebra mussels. And so what we do is we throw this plankton net out and we pull it back in. And what that's doing is filtering gallons of water through a small um, filter. And what we do is we take what's left in that filter and we look at it under a microscope. And we're trying to find the larva of those zebra mussels. And so this is just one of the many surveys that we're doing to catch these invasive species early so that we do have some management options. Another thing we do to prevent the spread of invasive species is outreach and education. And so um, the Game and Parks and myself employed seasonal technicians to conduct watercraft inspections, as well as to provide outreach to the public on how to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. And through these service, surveys, we're able to learn about travel patterns of people to better our outreach to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species to water bodies. And then on the right just shows throughout the year the um, outreach events we're part of, as well as I give presentations to a variety of audiences throughout the, throughout the year. So invasive species management, there's just so much invasive species management going on with all the different invasive species that we've talked about. And one example would be a biological control. And so we use biological control in Nebraska to control a number of plants and insects. And so one example would be the purple loosestrife. This is a wetland plant and it has lots of flowers as you can see, that means that it has lots of seeds. And so once this plant gets into a river or a wetland situation, it takes over. Now biological control, like I mentioned, is releasing a living organism to control another organism. And very rarely are we able to, to make this work because we're looking at in the native range where these, where these plants and animals are from, what controls them? So with the purple loose strife, we looked in Asia and we said, what controls this? And there's a number of insects that can that will lay um, eggs and the larvae and the adults will kill the plant. And so in order to be allowed to release a biological control in the United States, it goes through a rigorous process that normally takes at least two years and millions of dollars of funding because they're looking at all the different um, plant and, and animal species that could be impacted if this, if this um, biological control is released. And only after all that vetting occurs, do they then get government approval to release it. And so um, a successful example here is the purple loosestrife beetle here. And we actually have high school students that grow these, these beetles on a plant. They put a, a, a bag around it and then they take that plant out to the wetland and these insects will reproduce and, and kill all the purple loosestrife, but then they'll all die because that's its only host species. So really a cool example of biological control and how then we don't have to put chemicals out in, in a river or wetland system, we just release the insects. Another example of biological control is we have stingless wasps that are being released to control the emerald ash borer in Nebraska. 
So just another example of, of biological control. Allison? Yes. Um, how often does a biological control, um, a natural one, become an invasive species? Or is that something that people need to worry about? I know you said that it goes to rigorous uh, regulations and protocols and things like that, but how often does that happen? Yes, very good question, thank you. So the process to get a biological control approved in the United States means that they have to show that it that this, this bug, let's say for an example, will not have an, an impact on any other species that is in the area. And so to date, I'm not familiar with any that has been released in the, in the last 30 years that has become invasive. Um, so at least in, in recent history, that hasn't happened. Now we have some um, historical bad um, examples that things have been released that didn't go through that vetting process. But now that they've put in these rigorous standards, it, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're not allowed to release as many biological controls because it is so rigorous. Great question, thank you. And so, one thing that we do to control a lot of invasive plant species in the um, in Nebraska would be prescribed burning. And so the Game of Parks, for example, does a lot of prescribed burning to control the eastern red cedar as well as other invasive plants. And this is one um, one way to manage, but also, of course, using herbicides and also using grazing are also um, highly used in Nebraska to control invasive plant species. So what can you do to prevent the spread of invasive species? All of these pictured here are vectors for the spread of invasive species. So we have a canoe here. So if you're going to go um, boating, make sure that any um, that you clean, drain, dry that boat and anything else that got wet before you go and launched in a different water body. If you're going back to the same water body, that's fine. You know, we're, you're not going to move something. But when you move to another water body, we don't want you moving any aquatic invasive plants or organisms. So clean, drain and dry. Another example would be this ATV here. So if you ever are going off-roading, make sure that you clean the mud off of the tires and, and that vehicle, because in that mud could be invasive plant seeds and you don't wanna move that from one field to another. Another example here is a dog. If you like to go walking with your dog in a wooded area or a grassy area, make sure you brush them before you leave again, because we don't wanna spread those plant seeds to another, water, to another uh, field. And another thing is don't move firewood. So, um, moving firewood is, is a vector for the movement of invasive pests, and that includes invasive insects, including the emerald ash borer. And so a rule of thumb is do not move um, firewood from, from one county to another. So if you're in Lincoln and you're going to go camping in Kearney, don't take the firewood from Lincoln to Kearney because the insects and the pathogens we have in Lincoln, they may not have in Kearney. So buy it where you burn it. When you get to Kearney, buy that wood, burn it there. If you don't use it all, leave it there. Don't bring it back to Lincoln. Here's some resources I, um, I'd like you to check out. Please come to my website, anyinvasives.com. We have lots of field guides, brochures, education card sets. I'd be happy to send to you. So just go there and, and my contact information is on the website. Be happy to send you any of those. Also lots of information on the website about different invasive species of concern in Nebraska. And like, um, Monica mentioned, we have a reporting tool there. So if you ever see something and you think it's invasive or if you have a question about it, you can snap a picture, upload it and send it to me. And I will then um, send it on to the appropriate expert to investigate. And finally, here's my contact information. Please let me know um, how I can help you. I'm here to educate and provide outreach on all invasive species. And again, anyinvasives.com, please join us. And I will un unshare with that. All right. Thank you, Allison. Uh, we did have some questions in the chat. Um, someone asked, um, they asked specifically how like Game and Parks categorizes the Japanese beetle. It is an invasive species. Do we have, and I don't know of any, but maybe you do, we don't have any long-term plans to control that sp animal specifically, do we? Um, Correct. So the Japanese beetle is becoming more and more uh, more and more um, invasive throughout the state. So it's been really bad in Omaha for a long time. It's getting really bad in Lincoln as well. Um, this, this insect will follow a boom and bust kind of life cycle as many invasives do. And so it, it will over time become more rare, um, but it, it really is just about um, kind of living with it, unfortunately. Um, the, we have some good guidance on our website and the, the, the UNL extension. Um, the problem with the Japanese beetle is it has 300 plant species as hosts. So it likes roses, it likes lindens, it likes everything. The problem is 
Um, what I found some gardeners say is you basically just have one plant, you let it have it. And you say, this rose bush is yours. And then hopefully it'll spare some others. But the good thing to know is when it gets really bad here in Omaha, in Lincoln and Omaha, it will eventually go down to a lower level. It will eat itself out of house and home and, and go down. Um, it is not regulated in terms of um, being on a list by the Game of Parks or by the Nebraska Department of Ag. It's just really a pest and we really do have to kind of live with it. If you see it on any plants, knock it into some soapy water. Um, and do the last thing is do not put a trap in your in your uh, yard to to attract the Japanese beetle because all you're gonna do is bring all of your neighbors, Japanese beetles to eat everything in your yard. So do not use those lures, they're bad. Good to know they are not fun, I agree. No. Um, someone asked about the Eurasian collared doves. Um, since they are technically songbirds, but they are inv invasive, is it illegal to hunt them, um, to shoot them? Is there a season for them? What? Yes, great question. So please do shoot them. We do have a dove hunting season in Nebraska. Please get a permit and take part in it. And yes, we need you to hunt these doves during that season because that's the only control method we have. We aren't allowed to poison them. Um, to my knowledge. Um, so yeah, you can talk to Joel Jorgensen, I'm sure at Game of Parks and he might have some input as well, but please do hunt them because that is our management strategy for them. And like Allison said, make sure you have all the, the proper permits and, and the season and, um, and be safe about it. Please don't be shooting them rapidly in your front yard um, next to a daycare or something like that. So yes. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have that I see right now. Um, but does anyone have any other questions? We really kind of wanted to keep these uh, kind of short just because I know it's kind of a weird time, 10 a.m. on during the week, it's hard for people to get on, but um, we wanted to give that information. And also, um, if you follow the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission uh, Facebook page, as well as the Nebraska Wildlife Education Facebook page and Instagram page, we will have a bunch of posts about different invasive species this week, just kind of educating and highlighting some of those as well. So um, please go ahead and uh, check out those things as well. And like Allison said, check out her website, neinvasives.com. Com. There's a lot of good resources and educational materials there as well. And Allison, do you still have backpacks that you check out to people? Yes, I do. Okay. I did. Yep. I meant to include a picture of that. So we have backpacks with um, different specimens that I can send you and you can use to educate um, kids. So I have lots of resources. Please contact me. I'd be happy to let you know about them and provide them to you. Awesome. Well, if anyone has any other questions, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat. We'll stick around a little bit, but that's all that we have today. Um, but please be sure to check us out tomorrow, same time, 10 a.m. Um, there is a different link to register as well, um, but Allison will be talking about invasive plants tomorrow. So 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, if anyone has any questions, we can stay on a little bit longer. Um, otherwise, thanks for joining us today. Um, and please check out our Facebook page. I will go ahead and put that in the chat, Nebraska Wildlife Education and then also Allison's as well, the Nebraska Invasive Species Program, if I can type, it's Monday. All right, there we go. All right, thank you everyone. And these will be recorded um, if you wanted to use them or share that with someone that didn't get a chance to be here today, um, just Nebraska Game and Parks Education on our YouTube channel. So thank you everyone. We'll see you tomorrow, hopefully 10 a.m. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. All right. Thanks, Allison.